first webinar session of Chiyokrang Chapter 2. Before I begin, I would like to request all the viewers to please keep their cameras and microphones turned off throughout the lecture session. Good morning, good afternoon, and a hearty welcome to all the participants hailing from different time zones around the world, all united by a common cause here today, that is geology. I am Ritun Mukha, a member of the Geological Institute of the Department of Geology, Presidency University, and I shall be your host for the day. I will uh, request everybody to please keep their cameras and microphones off throughout the session, as this is extremely essential to maintain a smooth lecture. A question answer form has already been sent to all the participants via email and telegram groups along with the shared webinar link. In case if you don't find it in your inbox, kindly check your spam folder. If you are doing us on YouTube, don't forget to check the description box to find the attached link for the question answer form. On behalf of the Geological Institute, Residence University, I would like to welcome you all to the fifth lecture session of the whole Geochron series and to the first lecture of Geochron chapter two. Today, we are really fortunate to have with us Professor Shumit Chakraborty, Professor of Physical Chemical Mineralogy in Rohr University at Bochum, Germany, and he is also an alumnus of our department. Professor Dr. Shumit Chakraborty is a renowned petrologist and he is one of the most accomplished names in the field of physical chemical mineralogy. His primary research interest is to study the timescales over which geological and planetary processes occur using the tool of physical chemistry through applications of kinetics and diffusion modeling as well as thermodynamics. He has gathered remarkable field experiences from different parts of the globe and his work focuses on high temperature processes such as volcanism and many processes that occur in Earth's interior and other planetary bodies. Professor Chakraborty is a fellow of of America, the Geochemical Society, and the European Association of Geochemistry. His commendable work has made him the recipient of the Dana Medal in 2016 from the Mineralogical Society of America. He is the Vice President of the Geochemical Society and also the Associate Editor of ACS Earth and Space Chemistry. We are highly honored to have him with us delivering a talk on Reading the Metamorphic Rock Report, a case study from Second Himalayan. We are sure that the lecture session will be very much enriching and is going to be a great experience for all of us. I would now like to request our very own beloved Dr. Shankar Bose, Professor in the Department of Geology, Presidency University, to give a bit more introduction about our speaker and to welcome him to the virtual dance. Sir. Very good afternoon and very good morning to all the participants. Uh, it's an honor to introduce Professor Shumit Chakraborty in this forum. Uh, he's very kind to accept our offer to present his lecture in front of the students who are suffering for this uh, pandemic situation. Uh, I think uh, it's a very a difficult task to introduce Professor Shumit Chakraborty's work in such short time. But what I want to mention that he has done a fundamental, I mean, improvement in our understanding of the kinematics of reactions in the field of thermodynamics and, and he, what he has been doing for the last 30 years. So he has already uh, wrote more than 130 research publications and many students uh, were fortunate to work with him. And now I would, without wasting any more time, I would request Professor Chakraborty to start his lecture and illuminate us. Thank you. Please, Chakra Professor Chakraborty, start your talk. Well, thank you. 
Share your screen. What are you doing, guys? Yeah. Only Skype. Hong Kong, can you help? Uh, let me see. Oh, just a second. Yeah, yeah, it's coming. Yeah. Yeah. You have that now. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's yes. coming. So now you have the slides and you can hear me as well. Yes, sir. Can you hear? Uh, let me see. Yeah, yeah, it's coming. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so once again, th thank you for uh, ha having me here. And, and it's always a pleasure to come come back to, to presidency for um, uh, whatever occasions. Now, uh, what I'd like to do today is to talk about uh, uh, reading the metamorphic rock record and use the Sikkim Himalaya as an example for one particular case study. Now, um, I was told that uh, most of the um, audience today are students. So the way I have set up this talk is um, basically in three parts. So the first part is really an introduction to um, reading the rock record and metamorphism. And the second part deals with actual observations and data from Sikkim. And the third part kind of uh, synthesizes it uh, together. Um, OK, so in a little bit more detail, uh, that's the plan of the talk here today. So we talk about reading the rock record very generally. Then we talk a little bit about metamorphism and why that's relevant. Uh, then we talk about why Himalaya is a very good uh, natural laboratory, very briefly, uh, followed by some of the research questions that you can answer or try to address in um, high temperature processes in the Himalaya. And finally, I'll get to um, our work on one problem. Now, of course, this last point here is what I'll um, spend most of the time on the talk on. OK, so reading the rock record, this is a picture from uh, the wall of our old uh, department. We've moved to a new building now. But in the old building, we used to have pieces of rocks on the walls, and this was one of them. An example of a graphic granite, which uh, probably all of you are uh, familiar with. Now, the name comes from something like this. So it's called a graphic granite because if you compare that with, uh, um, you, if you compare that with this Hebraic text on the right, then uh, you see there's a close similarity. And the idea was, um, the analogy would be that if you can read this Hebraic text, you know what the uh, story behind uh, the writing is. Similarly, you could, if you could read the uh, uh, granite here, petrologically, you would know what the story behind that one is. And the classic questions used to be, uh, if you had a rock, uh, which you all know is a, a collection of minerals, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What's the definition of a rock? And the question we used to ask was, uh, what was the condition of formation of the rock? That's what we always ask. What was the, so if you're looking at a metamorphic rock, what was the pressure, what was the temperature, and so forth. 
Now that has changed a bit in the last few years. So now we don't ask what was the condition of the rock formation, what we asked what were the conditions of formation plural. And a rock is seen as a record of uh, processes, chemical, mechanical, thermal, and even you know electromagnetic or something. So now the moment you go from the single question, what was the condition of formation to what were the conditions of formation, a series of new questions come up. So the old question was, you know, at what conditions, so for example, again, sticking to metamorphism, what pressure, what temperature did a rock form in? And that you got from using thermodynamics, okay? Uh, but now, because you have many different uh, um, processes that are being recorded, or, you know, it was always recorded, now we're trying to read that, um, we are asking what were the conditions of formation, and, and the moment you have several of these things, then the immediate question comes up, what stage of evolution of the rock does each of these pressure, temperature, and time? You know, time could be date, time could be duration of a process, time could be cooling rate, time could be exhumation rate. Uh, what do these things relate to? And I'll show you in a minute that becomes uh, quite critical in how we read our rock record. Um, and then the third question is, if you have several of these things happening um, all at the same time or one after another, then what is preserved and what is overwritten? You know, the time plays a role, how much time you have for a process to occur. And that has kind of established new fields called uh, geospedometry or diffusion chronometry. And all of these things now require that you also do kinetics in addition to thermodynamics, because you have to now worry about how long a thing would be preserved, at what stage something gets frozen, uh, what particular stage is something representing, and so on. Okay, so um, the task now then is to read a record of processes. Now these processes also are not always in a series, right? I mean, you can have chemical processes, changes in mineralogy going on, and at the same time, mechanical processes, deformation of something going on. And these may affect one another. So some of these processes may be in series. So, you know, you may form one reaction, one mineral, and then that reacts to form the next mineral that could be in series. Or you can have a, a mineral forming and deformation going on that's in parallel, and that may affect what minerals you form next, okay? So um, in doing, in studying all of these things, one of the things that turns out to be quite useful is compositional zoning in minerals. So what I show here is a picture you'll see again later. So that's a picture of a garnet with uh, the colors represent a concentration of magnesium in the rock. And what you see is that there are different magnesium concentrations in different parts of the garnet from yellow to blue. And each concentration tells you a different part of the story, okay? So the way to look at these things is that um, you, the rock is a book and it's just not a conventional book. It's a hyperlinked ebook where you have links in series and links in pages in series and links in parallel, both of them going on. Okay, so with that, let's get to metamorphism. Uh, why is uh, metamorphism important or relevant? Now, metamorphism, as you all know, is a transformation of rock, neurological and structure, in a more or less solid state. You can have some melts, we'll be dealing with melts today, in fact, but uh, mostly in a, in a solid state. And now, most of the continental crust is metamorphic. Now that's uh, something that's really important to realize. You have a thin layer of sediments on top, and anything below that, even if you have a lot of granite or granodiorite, that's in, if it's sitting at five, 600 degrees, uh, that's a metagranite. Okay, so uh, essentially you are looking at, if you want to know about the continental crust, you got to read the metamorphic rock record. Now in talking about metamorphic rock record, you see these concepts of in yellow that I've uh, outlined here. And those are, um, this particular picture comes from an article by Brown and Johnson because it was in color, but really the diagram comes from a textbook from Phil Potts and Agu. So, um, so I assume many of you may be familiar with it, but I'd nevertheless like to go over some of the aspects of what this diagram tells you. So what you see here is a geotherm, so this one for example, and what has happened here is uh, a thrusting where something, a piece of crust with this kind of temperature distribution with depth has been piled on top here. So the, the result of that, you have a sort of a um, sawtooth kind of a pattern in the geotherm. Um, 
Now, very quickly, do you see my mouse when I move it? Yes, sir. Okay. So, um, so that's your your turn. Now, this uh, this piece of crust also generates heat. So, as a result of that, things get heated up. So the red lines here are geotherms at different times. That's what you see here at the bottom. Uh, at different times in million years, you see that the in this case the thing happens is getting hotter. Now, the important point is you do not have one geotherm. You have geotherms that are changing with time. So these red lines are sweeping through this space. Now, as you do that, you can take a piece of rock that could be something that's sitting here. Now, um, first of all, if that's a uh, made a sediment rock or something that has not gotten there um, on its own. So there was a history before that. It somehow moved in from below here. Let me actually uh, try to see if I can do something with this. I, excuse me. I'll just... I'll be back in a second. Okay. Do you see the um, slide still? No, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I shouldn't have messed with it. OK, I'll try to get it back in a minute. Just a second. Do you see it now? Yes, so we can see it now. Okay, and can you can you see some lines on this? No, it's okay. Never mind. I just use my marker. So um so you have a sawtooth geotherm that's moving through here, and then there's a piece of rock which is sitting here, which first of all should have gotten here at this depth and temperature somehow. So there's a history before this year, but then uh, as it um, because of erosion in this case, some some partly could be due to thrusting. Uh, this thing moves along a very different line. This is the blue line along which it moves. That's the PT path, the second of these things. So the point is that the blue line and the red line are very different. And then, you know, there's a, at the intersection of the blue and the red, at some point you read, reach, uh, in this case, a maximum of temperature. And the idea in this diagram is that things get frozen at that condition. And that black line is what you ultimately see in the rock that comes up on the surface. So that's your metamorphic field gradient. That's what you find in the field. And that's a frozen equilibrium straight. I mean, it could be equilibrium. That's why I put it in a bracket. It doesn't have to be equilibrium but it's a frozen state. And what that immediately tells you is that uh, uh, this thing, this whole thing depends strongly on, on rates and uh, durations of processes. So for example, it depends on how fast these red lines are sweeping through this place here. That depends, for example, on how much radioactive heat generation you have in this piece of crust. If you have more uranium and thorium, you'll have move, these things will move faster. If you have less uranium, thorium and potassium, then these things will move slow. How fast this blue line moves depends on the rate of erosion in this model. And in a real situation, it can depend on how the rate of your thrusting works or whatever other tectonic processes are going on. And finally, what freezes in here depends on the kinetics of the reaction. So the mineral that forms at the peak temperature may be what is frozen, but then, you know, as you're cooling this rock, exhuming this rock, there may be other processes that freeze up here, and they will see a very different history. So for example, if you're looking at high temperature granulites, your texture in, in, in quartz, in rocks, could be something that's frozen up here. And then as the rock moves up, so things like apatite fission tracks will really record things way up here. So in other words, they will all, the, all these tools show you something about the history of the rock but they show you different things. They do not always see, give you the, they do not give you the same story 
And if you can piece it together, then you can get a very complete uh, dynamic picture of the whole thing. So the story is much more complicated than just the formation of a rock. But on the other hand, you are now able to extract much more about the dynamics of all these processes, how fast thrusting was working, how fast exhumation was working, how fast erosion was working, what was the thermal structure of the crust, what were the rate of reactions. All of these are to be read from this rock record. OK, so that's something I wanted to get across to you. Now, one thing about freezing processes is shown in this sketch here. So let's assume you have a, uh, any process that's going through a temperature time history, a rock that's going through this blue path here, and some property that freezes around here at this yellow point, probably the TC for closure, but doesn't matter. So um, anything that freezes here, this is just a property of uh, kinetics of processes, uh, that this records the history of the rock just a little bit before and after the um, point where it freezes. So this thing here, if you study this property here, whatever that is, you know, your, your thermometer, that will give you cooling rate and temperatures around this part. It has no information, no memory of what was going on before there, nothing about what goes on after there. This will turn out to be very important, okay? And that applies to every tool. So we just saw that, you know, different tools give you information about different pieces of the history. And remember that each tool gives you uh, an information about locally that part of the history and doesn't know anything about before and after, okay? All right, so if you have all these different tools and if you're going to try to get the whole history, you need to use different disciplines. And this looks a little bit like that. I've just put on a jigsaw puzzle of the kinds of tools we'll be looking at today a little bit. So you can have, you know, you're talking about metamorphic rocks, so we can have thermobarometry. You can look at reactions and textural relations. You can do geochronology with major minerals such as garnets. You can do geochronology with accessory minerals to give you different pieces of information, things like zircons and monazites. You can do the new tool, diffusion chronometry that I was talking about. And you can look at structure, microstructure of the rocks, and you can also do geodynamic modeling. Now, clearly, and then there are other issues like um, if you go down to lower temperature history, sedimentary features, uh, neotectonics and geomorphology, um, information you get from seismics or paleomag, and finally, low temperature tectonics and exhumation, you'll see is very important. And it's also important to know that all of these things appear work on different length scales. So for example, if you're looking at diffusion, you're looking at sub micrometer scales, you're looking at concentration gradients that were in nanometers sometimes. And if you're looking at geodynamic modeling, you're looking at you know, thousands of kilometers and you'll see examples of both today, okay? And they also operate on different time scales. So again, you know, so the geodynamic modeling occurs on scales of millions of years whereas some of these reactions and things will face on scales of melting, for example, happens on scales of hundreds of thousands of years or even thousands of years, okay? So if you have all of these things and you've got to put this together, the thing that I like to point out always is this. This is a story that all of you know well, and uh, the story of the blind man and the elephant. And, you know, one person goes and just look, feels a tusk and says the elephant is like a spear. The other person feels the ear and says it's like a fan and so forth. And they argue about what the elephant looks like, whether it's a rope, a pole, a wall, a fan, and so on. But of course, the elephant as a whole is when you put all of that together in a proper manner, okay? And that's something that we'll see is, I think this is a picture that should be at the top of every geoscience department on earth, okay? Because each one of our tools look at only a very small segment of the whole elephant and the whole our task is to try to figure out the elephant okay so with that let's get to himalaya so we have now set up what we should be trying to do let's go to the himalaya and straight we move away to the situation today so this is just a very recent paper which shows the gps data from uh, um, the himalayan region and this is something all of you know, but what's important to realize is this is something that's going on now, and we can observe and measure it now, that India is moving into China respect to something up here north in respect to Siberia, let's say. 
and you can measure how fast it's moving in what direction it's moving you know that there's this collision going on between india and china and there's a flow of crustal material up to the east and these are based on data from 1991 to 2015 so basically within all of your lifetimes okay and moreover this is just taken from you Wikipedia, you can get it from any textbook. Even in the geological past, we know very well how the plate, Indian plate, moved and collided with, with uh, Asia. So um, the history, the plate tectonic history is very known. The current situation is very well known. And what's very important in terms of geological processes, there's no superposition. It's something that's happening now, and we are looking at it on the surface today. So it provides us a perfect natural laboratory that you do not get if you go and work on things that are uh, geologically uh, dead, let's say. So then looking at Himalaya, what are some of the research uh, questions? Um, first of one, of course, is how do mountains form? Uh, how do rocks get exhumed to the surface and things like that? Then there's a feature called inverted metamorphism, uh, which is where you have hot rocks that you ideally think should be forming at depth. Uh, why are they sitting on top? But already now, you know, in what I've just told you, you see that if you don't have such a uh, static picture of metamorphism, this is actually not that big a problem. Okay, so it's really a matter of what you are freezing where and bringing it up. Then in the context of Himalaya, there are many faults. One of them, the most important one is main central thrust. And there's a lot of debate arguments about what is it and where is it in any given region. Uh, you have the uh, questions really, so that's more, you know, related to structural geology, but you know, it turns out you have to deal with structural geology and, you know, all of those other disciplines as well. Similarly, this is more igneous petrology, you know, leucogranites, uh, crustal melt granites. How do they form? Uh, those are some of the questions. And what I'll do today is I'll talk about the first one of these. How do mountains form and exhumation of rocks? I'll not talk about all these other ones, although we have worked on those and I'll be happy to answer questions if you have any. So this is a very simplified geological map of India. Uh, you know, and to this audience, I don't need to explain why usually when I give the talk elsewhere, I have to say where exactly it is, but you know, all of you know, where um, Himalaya is, and it goes from Pakistan all the way to this truncated here, goes all the way to the east to uh, Arunachal Pradesh and Nagaland in eastern India. And in this, if you look at it from a distance, what you see is these patches of color that are linear bells. So these are linear uh, lithological units, bo bodies with names such as Lesser Himalaya, Higher Himalaya, Tethian sequence, and so on. And these are separated from each other by faults. Okay, so that's a very broad, simple um, um, geological background of uh, Himalaya. And we'll be working on the eastern part of that out here in Sikkim. So I'll show you the map in a... So this is now our map of uh, uh, Sikkim, geological map of Sikkim, based on uh, the um, G map produced by GSI and we added features on or based on our own observations into it. Now, why do we go to Sikkim from all of this Himalaya? You know, why, why not somewhere else? Uh, it's simply because Sikkim has an incredibly well-preserved uh, sequence. So you can study things, um, I would argue, um, better in Sikkim than just about anywhere else. Now, what I'll be talking about today is this upper part here, the greater Himalayan part or the higher Himalayan part. Um, and in this thing here, I'd like to point out a couple of names to you. So Gangtok, for example, for orientation is down here in the green part. Uh, and I'll show you what the green and the orange look like. But this brownish thing, the greater Himalayan thing, uh, has um, uh, places called Lachin. So this is Chungkang. Is That's about where we plot our MCT boundary. Um, quite arguable, um, but that's where we think it is, should be. But it's not too relevant for our talk today. So between Chungkang and Lachen, you have what we call the CLN block, comes from Chungkang and Lachen. And in the north, from between Tangu and Gurudangmar, we call it the TG block. And what you see is there's some kind of a discontinuity in between. So what that tells you is that the Greater Himalaya is not one coherent uh, unit. Uh, we're probably looking at two different things within it. 
And that's something that will become relevant as you go through. OK. So then if you're going to do all of these things, it's also very clear you cannot do all of that yourself. There's no person who's an expert in all of these things. So it's very important that you get the experts together and you talk to them and you work with them together. So before I get into too much of that, it's very important that I recognize them. And these are the people who have been involved in uh, different aspects of this work. So I just go through quickly because I do think it's important that you don't just show us a few names. You just uh, take a minute to tell who's what. So Shomla Dashgupta, many of you will know him. Is a metamorphic petrologist, of course, in ISR Kolkata. Uh, Dilip Mukhopadha, Dilip Da is a structural geologist in IIT Ruki. Uh, Robert Ankevich is in Poland. He does uh, uh, many things, but in, for us, he did uh, lutetium hafnium uh, dating of garnets. Daniela Rubato was in Australia at the time, but she's in band now, that did the work on zircons and monocytes. Uh, Nilanjana Sharka did a PhD with uh, Shonad Damengli, also with me. Uh, looking at cooling rates in, in the um, rocks. Then uh, we have uh, Manuel Fachenda, who did a lot of the geodynamic modeling with Tara Skeria, who's in um, Eteha, Zurich, in Switzerland. Uh, Claudia Tretman is a structural microtexture person, looked at the microtextures of the rocks and things. She's in Munich, a professor in Munich. Um, Kashka, Katsina Kolotnik, is a student of uh, Taras who looked at zircons actually from uh, Sikkim. Fred Gaidis is a metamorphic petrologist in Ontario. And Priyodoshi Choudhury was a student with me, he's in Australia now. He helped to synthesize and put the whole things together. Okay, so let's go back, to get to work now. So this is the Lesser Himalaya green, higher Himalayan crystallines of greater Himalaya in brown. So Lesser Himalaya. Green on the map, looks green in the field, very green, very vegetation rich, very pretty, but also a lot of soil formation, not too good for uh, geologists always. In contrast, in the brown here, in high Himalayan crystalline are also brown in the field, no trees, uh, very little trees, fresh outcrops, fresh rocks, uh, hard to get up there. If you get up there, beautiful geology. Okay, so the question, how do mountains form? Mechanisms of uh, exhumation of rocks, uh, which is related, but not exactly the same as uplift. So that's important to distinguish. Now, there are many aspects of it. One context that has been going on in a big debate is uh, two modes called channel flow or critical taper. Now, maybe I'll have a chance to talk a little bit about that uh, towards the end of this talk. Uh, but uh, one of these uh, channel flow can come in, uh, both of these can actually come in different uh, variants of the models, various flavors. Now this channel flow, one of the things, uh, models that was um, suggested or discussed was that it's a hot, soft uh, rock that flows in the, in the lower to middle crust, but then it also kind of bends up here and, and opens in the, in the uh, surface where you have an erosional porthole and the erosion you know, of material being transported away from here is what allows this thing to continue down here. So what that requires is not just a channel at the, sorry, channel at the bottom here, but also this part moving up, which I'll call a funnel later on. Um, so those are, you know, issues of discussion. Now, if you have something like that, of course, then the process is at low, um, uh, uh, lower crustal parts, you know, um, high temperatures and pressures become, uh, related to erosional processes, monsoon, and all of these things on the surface. So again, you know, things are related to each other. You cannot just assume one thing is isolated from the other. Now, uh, written several papers on this, so I just, just put it on there so you can go to, go to them and get the references and look at them to see where the information is coming from that I'm going to talk about next. So this is now High Himalaya. So this is now uh, up in this Lachen Tango Guru Dongmar area. So this is, I think, a little bit south of Lachen. This is up near Guru Dongmar. Um, and as I said, very good, clear outcrops, fresh outcrops, magmatitic, nice, uh, lots of rocks. You can just go in Yak territory or you can just go and collect your samples. Okay. So if you collect your samples, this is what you get. So fresh. Um, Migmatites, uh, 
high temperature magnetized quartz. <coughs> quartz F S power the aqueous biotite aluminosilicate, which is uh, mostly sillimanite, some kyanite, and garnet. And in thin sections, this is what they look like. You have garnets here with some biotite you know, between these are these two rocks. These are the two things I was talking to you about. CLN is from a little bit from the south, between Chungtang and Lachen. TG is uh, a little bit to the north, Tangu and Gurudongma. As you see, the rocks look pretty similar. But you'll see if you look at it in detail, then differences show up. So what you want to do with these rocks, you want to get the pressure and temperature of metamorphism. I put them in plural. I'd like to emphasize that pressures and temperatures. You want to get dates, the timing of metamorphism. Use garnet and zircon and monazite from that. And you also get the cooling rate after the peak of metamorphism. So getting to the pressures and temperatures, you start by looking at the thin sections and the textures and try to infer reactions from them. From them, uh, There are a lot of different things. This is from the PhD thesis of uh, Nila, Nila and Juna Shorka. Um, so a couple of things uh, I want to point out here is that, uh, first of all, you have evidence for uh, the kinds of melting reaction that happened. It turns out you have had a series of melting reactions here, but one of those is this biotite uh, dehydration melting reaction where you have biotite silicate plagioclase quartz reacting to give you garnet kefir spar melt. You see all of these uh, things as inclusions in the garnet, so that gives you an indication that there's something like that may have uh, happened. Uh, what's very important are these retrograde reactions. So you have things like garnet reacting with silimonite to give you spinel plus plagioclase or garnet silimonite quartz giving you quartzite. Now, this is here garnet, uh, there's slimonite in the neighborhood quartz. We form a rim of cordierite around the garnet. So that's garnet breaking down between slimonite and garnet to form cordierite. This is now here, um, this dark thing here is where if you look at it in higher magnification, is an intergrowth of spinel and plagioclase. And you'll see that, remember just spinel and cordierite, this will turn out to be very important in the story that comes up afterwards. Okay, so what do you do with that is you go try to determine temperatures and pressures. Well, there are different ways of getting temperatures and pressures. Now, what you have to do is conventionally, you just used um, uh, thermodynamics to get <coughs> thermobarometers and get temperatures, but there are now different tools and each one has its strengths and weaknesses. For example, you can have individual reactions where you can look at very specific local situations, for example, that garnet and cordierite that I was uh, showing you earlier. But there are many issues with calibration. There are different calibrations. There are questions of which one to use and so on and so forth. Then there's a tool called Average PT where you use, um, where you uh, do um, different um, um, reactions all together. And that then requires that all of them needs to be frozen at the same time. Remember what I was showing you earlier. Uh, different reactions do not necessarily have to freeze at the same time. Okay, so that's something you have to worry about. Then there are petrogenetic grids, which are just putting reaction things uh, together, uh, not for a specific uh, bulk composition. And you can do the same sort of thing with uh, specific bulk compositions where you minimize the free energy of the overall system. Really, it's a phase diagram for a given bulk composition. The name that's used in metamorphic petrology is Zero sections. Now, when you go to igneous petrology, you don't call them zero sections anymore. But um, the advantage of that is that gives you um, uh, the phase assemblage that would be stable at a particular pressure and temperature. It tells you what the modal abundance of the different minerals and melt would be. Uh, it tells you what the compositions of each one of those minerals and melts would be. But again, that requires the whole um, system to have been in equilibrium together. What is very important for metamorphic rocks is that um, the bulk composition that you measure today had to have been the same that was there during the metamorphism. And one thing we know for sure that uh, metamorphism is a process where you lose water. So um, the water content of the rock today is certainly not uh, what uh, may have been there during the metamorphism. Uh, there may be local equilibrium processes going on. So the, each one of these things have a different area of strength and weaknesses. 
And so what you try to do to get the best constraint is to put all of them together. That's what we did, or rather Nila did. So this is what it looks like. Now this is a very, very messy diagram. And uh, the only reason I put it up here is for you to see that uh, uh, it's a lot of work. And in pressure and temperature, there are very complex, many different phases that are stable. And I'll simplify and tell you the essence of that in a minute, okay? Um, so I just wanted to show you what such a diagram looks like. Uh, what you may start focusing on is this sort of white diamond here. I'll color this diagram soon, so you'll be able to see this uh, prominently in red. And this is really the area where the assemblage that we actually find in the field, in Sikkim, of course, in our rock. So that gives you a constraint on pressure and temperature, where right? the rock may have seen. Now note, I do not say where the rock formed, okay? Because the rock had a journey. And this is just one of the conditions that the rock saw. Now what you can do, this is the same diagram now, drawn many times over with a lot of lines. And what you see is that what I just told you, you can calculate um, different compositional features, different uh, phase assemblage features, so for example, the sodium content in the melt, or the magnesium content in garnet, or uh, magnesium content in biotite, and so on and so forth. So these are called isoplates, these are contours. And then, of course, you can go and try to match them with what you actually find in the rock. So there's a lot of information with which you can try to um, constrain what conditions the rocks on the melt. So now this is the color diagram, same diagram, and let me explain what's going on here. So everything that's in green is where you do not have melt. So there are different mineral assemblages, but you do not have any melt in there. So these dotted lines are different kinds of melting reactions, mostly where you start making more and more melt. So everything in red and also in blue, uh, or mostly in red though, uh, are areas where you have melt. So if you have melt in the rock, you're somewhere in this red area, okay? And this blue and purple are areas where you have uh, those cordierite and or spinel. I told you that would be important. Note that that's, you know, out here. So what I've also plotted on this is when you go and do individual reactions, so these are things like iron and magnesium between garnet and biotite, uh, and use uh, the calcium content of plagioclase with garnet, you can get pressure and temperatures from different rocks, and those are these stars here. And this is where you start seeing that the TG and the CLN are uh, separating out a little bit, but still they're very similar. And, you know, there's some mismatch, but overall, so that's your scatter, that's your uncertainty that you've got to live with. But overall, you can say quite well that, you know, you're between 8 to 10 kilobars and 750 to 800 degrees, you are forming uh, melt in these rocks. And you also can tell how much melt would have been there in these rocks, okay? And you also use all these different tools to confirm that that's the real answer. So then what works out is you can start working out the journey of the rocks. So to get there, these are metapalytic rocks. So these are sediments that they obviously began their life somewhere um, near the surface at some point. It got here, we don't know how. In a collision zone, you expect the PT path to follow something like that. So it's a dashed line, this is not really well constrained, but then what we do know is this happened, that the rocks formed cordierite and spinel, we saw that, and to form that, you have to come into this blue field. And to come into this blue field, you cannot just you know, start cooling as you go from here, because then you would just miss the blue field here. So you have to reduce pressure without reducing temperature, okay? And then there are other indications which then tell us that you also reached a PT point here, so a lower pressure at around five kilobars and about 600 degrees or a little lower maybe, 550, and um, that's here. So that tells you that the rock went through a journey that looked something like that. So this thing here is called uh, isothermal decompression, so pressure reduction without change in temperature. Now, when you have that, what you also immediately know is something about the rate, because if you're taking a hot rock, from depth and bringing it up to a shallower depth without changing the temperature, that process has to be fast. Because otherwise, if you bring it up too slowly, you'll start cooling the rock, okay? So that's just not pressure and temperature, that telling you something about rates processes as well. But we'll see more of that in a minute. 
Okay. So what it turns out, what was nice was that we could work, go in and work out, you know, how much melt you form in here. And it turned out that as you start making more and more melt, you reduce the density and the viscosity of the whole rock package. And that's uh, something that you calculate from those same phase diagram calculations. And so it's very reasonable that if you reduce the density and the viscosity, um, then the rock would try to move up. You know, it's like if you have a... Um, piece of lead that you're sinking in a, in a, in a um, body of water and the lead suddenly becomes a piece of cork and the cork would try to bob up, okay? And what is also nice is it that when it comes and stops, and this is something we just determined from looking at the reaction sectors, looking at the thermogrammetry and so forth. Now, it turns out this is also where the melt freezes. So it turns out you have a process of melting that reduces the density of viscosity that allows the rock to move up very uh, quickly but then when the melt freezes, it also stalls, it stops. It doesn't, you know, go all the way to the surface, somewhere in mid to lower crust, and then it starts cooling, uh, you know, down here. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about uh, time, date. So we know sort of what was going on. We need to look a little bit about when this was going on. So this is the work of Robert Ankevich, where this is in the days from the Lesser Himalaya. I won't be talking about that. So if you look at these rocks here, just very quickly, uh, you get times of about 28, 26 uh, million years. So these are from the garnets. And Daniela Rubato did the same uh, rocks with zircon and monazite and got the same sort of rocks. Now, again, this is where it becomes very important to know what is it that a rock is dating. Um, in this case, so this is why I show this picture here where you show the lutetium content in the garnet. Um, this is looks a little bit, you know, haphazard and zoned, but in terms of trace elements, this is on a normal scale. This is pretty much the same concentration all over. Okay, and what that tells you, if you look at the kinetics and everything, is that this is the date at those peak pressure and temperature conditions, those eight to ten kilobars and uh, eight hundred degrees or so. And that is different for these lower grade rocks. That's why it is so important. So that's not something I'm talking about today, but here it turns out they do not date the uh, peak of the metamorphism, they date actually the start of garnet growth. But for here, you know, that's the peak of metamorphism. So we know when the rock was at those uh, eight to 10 kilobar and, and uh, 800 degree kind of things. So then we have the zircon and monazite dates from Daniela. So when, if you look at the pattern, there's some, there's several things come out uh, of the pattern. So these are the different dates from different samples. These are the CLN samples at the bottom. This is TG samples on the top. In between, you have the samples in between, Lachen and Tangle. Uh, very broadly overall, you see that the CLN samples are a little bit uh, older than, there's some overlap, but they're a little bit older than uh, TG samples. And that goes through the zircon things as well. So um, what you can also do with these things here is look at not just the dates, but the trace elements of the zircons and use that to connect the, the uh, date that you get from a particular part of the zircon or monazite with uh, a particular stage of the metamorphic history. So you connect now the dates with the history and you get something like this. So you see the CLN and the TG, the TG went to a little bit of a higher pressure a little bit later but basically they're the same sort of uh, pressure temperature history. So the CLN, let's focus on that, uh, was getting heated up, crossing a melt field somewhere between 31 and 28 million years. Between 28 to 25, it was going through this phase of sort of decompression. And after that, it was cooling down uh, at the mid-crustal level. And the TG does the same thing a little bit uh, later, okay? So that's the date and the timing, but how quickly was all of this happening? Do we have information about the cooling rate? So to do that, we go and use a different tool again. So now we go down to really micrometer scale. So I realized after I put together the slide that I don't have a scale bar here, which is something I always tell my students to do, so this is bad of me. So this gun, it would be um, you know, a couple of millimeters uh, big. So this is a garnet. Uh, this is a magnesium map, so yellow is high, the scale bar is here, so blue is low. So if you go from the core of the garnet to the rim, the magnesium concentration grows down. 
Uh, you can show very clearly that this is related to the presence of biotite, which is around here. Where you don't have biotite, you don't have that decrease. Yeah, and there's a different garment from um, actually this one is a CLN, the other is a TG sample. Okay, so what you can do is you can measure the concentrations from there. That should be shown here. So this is iron and magnesium. The dots are the measured concentrations. And you can model how fast the things diffused to get to this kind of a profile. And that's the models are these lines here. So the lines are the fit to the concentration data. And as you see, you can uh, describe them quite well. Um, what you also see here is that in a TG, you know, you look at the scale bar here, uh, the concentration gradient is over a pretty small distance. This is in micrometers. Again, pretty bad of me. I should have written down micrometers here. So these are all the things we tell students not to do. So this is 0 to 20 micrometers here. On the other hand, the CLN, it's a much, much longer profile. So what you can tell immediately from this without even modeling, just by looking at this, is that the CLN sample cooled much slower. It had much longer time to diffuse over a much longer distance than the TG sample. So those rocks that looked very similar, you know, uh, if you look at these kinds of details, it turns out they have differences in their histories. Okay, so there's even more detail in there. If you look at that, this is one of those profiles. If you try to fit them with a constant cooling rate, what happens is if you try to fit this part of the gradient, then it turns out that you go up here, you don't fit the profile well. On the other hand, if you're trying to fit this part of the profile, then you fit that well, but out here, you don't fit it very well. So to get the whole fit, you need a nonlinear cooling history. You cannot fit the whole thing with a constant cooling history. So you have a very rapid nonlinear cooling of these rocks between 800 and 600 degrees. And that's very important to say, because again, below 600 or below 550 or 500, we have no idea what happened with these things. That's not a piece of history that these rocks record, okay? So now you have all these different pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, excepting not in this form. We have the individual pieces, and the task now is to put them together. We want to get them all together. So let's try to do that now. So this is what we have. So this is now our prograde history, which we don't know too well, was the dotted line. We know we hit this part here, 8 to 10 kilowatts, 800 degrees. We know we uh, decompress without cooling too much down to um, a lower pressures at the same temperatures. And we know we cooled without changing pressure too much uh, down to 600 degrees or so. And we know when all of those was happening and what rate those were happening. So the interval of melting that we got from uh, Daniela Rubatos, Sircon and Monazite tells us that the CLN and the TG at different times were getting heated up. So this is temperature against time. This is depth against time time moving towards the left. So as you go to the left, you're coming towards more recent history. So zero is out here, okay? So at 31 to 28, the rocks were getting heated up. They're getting buried down. That's this part of the history. And the ridge here, that's the maximum depth and temperature. So that's the deepest point, the highest temperature. Then you have a history of decompression, right? I mean, and, and without cooling. So that looks like this. This now comes from the data from Daniela as well as from Robert because we have information on the peak temperature here. Now here the pressure and temperature curves look different, right? So the pressure is changing, decompressing, that's what's going on here, but the temperature stays the same. So that the curves look different when you get to this point. And then you have keep the pressure constant and you cool, so you have Pressure constant, things are cooling down here. And the cooling rate, the slope of this, we know from uh, the cooling work that Nila did. So we know how quickly it cooled. So the temperature history has a different shape than the pressure history, but we can work it out quantitatively in both cases. And in both cases, things stop at about 15 kilometers mid crust and at about 500 degrees or maybe a little, uh, 500 degrees or 550 or so, okay? So after that, what happened? The rocks are in the surface today. We don't know what happened there, okay? Not from anything, I mean, we've done a lot of things, but still we don't know anything beyond this stage. 
And then uh, we also worked on the Lesser Himalaya. So I'll just plot down what Lesser Himalaya did. So I just want to show that the Lesser Himalaya went through a burial and heating and cooling history, but happened later than the Higher Himalaya. So there's a difference in age between them. But that's not something we're talking about today. So let's just move down here. So this is our pressure temperature history. This is the part that we got on the pressure depth time and temperature time history that we got to this circle or a little beyond uh, from our high temperature work. Um, but we also have some low temperature work from the same region. This is uh, from Don Kellett et al. They looked at appetite and zircon fission tracks. And they worked out also a nonlinear uh, cooling history that looks like this here, okay? But because it's the same region, they should be related. So what we did was we took that and put it out here. And if you do that, then you get this sort of this very zigzag kind of path. So you come up here, you um, bury the rock, you bring it up, you don't bring it up all the way to the surface. You have a long period of stalling at mid crust, 15, 16 kilobars, and then you have sort of again a pulsed uh, motion up. As you bring it up, you also cool the rocks. So this is cooling related to exhumation. And I've kind of tried to synthesize or summarize all of that in this paper here. So what we see, what we are doing here is we are putting together pieces locally in space and time to get the overall picture. And if you had connected the dots, if you just had the peak pressure and temperature, and let's say we had the apatite fission track and we connected them in a straight line, we would get an average behavior, that would be fine, but we will completely miss this part here. And as you'll see, this is a very, very important part in the tectonic history. That the fact that these rocks were stalling in the mid crust for a, a long time. Okay. All right. So let's now move to geodynamics and see what how you can produce all of these things. And before we do any of the modeling or anything, uh, what we have here is a hot and soft rock that is being squeezed. Okay. So there's no question about it. And if you're squeezing something that's hot and soft, it has to flow. So the question really becomes where and how. Okay, and uh, so we looked at this in this paper where we did some geodynamic modeling. These are some graphics from that paper. Um, what we find is this hot and soft rock. I use the same color as for the greater Himalayan rock. So this brown here is sort of the hot molten rock in each case. And what you see, this is a time sequence. What you see is that as the rocks get down there, at some point it starts making a melt. And once you make the melt, uh, as you saw, it tries to move uh, up, uh, but it doesn't move up vertically. You cannot just move a piece of metal vertically through a uh, crust. So what it does, it gets squeezed out like this, and it does form a channel, kind of, okay? And it moves up, and, and it, it pushes the isotherms along the thing, because it's hot material moving up to shallow depths. Um, so it's not really like a fault, because a fault at least when I think of it as a plane, something, you know, even or a shear zone. This is a entire region that's uh, sort of uh, molten and moving. So it is a little bit like this channel, but we do not see any evidence of this funnel part here. That's why I was trying to distinguish the two, okay? So we do have a channel, we do not have the funnel. Okay. So the other thing that we have to worry about in this context of Sikkim is that we have these CLN rocks and the TG, these are cross section and you know, all these different faults, the Sir Himalayan and so forth, but this reddish part is what we're dealing with today now, the higher Himalayan crystallines. And so we have two pieces there, right? The CLN and the TG, these were being metamorphosed at different times, at different rates. So there's some you know, relative movement between those two themselves as well. So that's uh, something going on here. So you can have, you know, multiple channels. Maybe there's some evidence from um, the field that that may be more complicated than just a simple one single channel, okay? All right, so what I wanted to do next was, and this will be tricky again, to show you a movie where all of this happens. So they'll put it all together, okay? Uh, so before I get to the movie, let me just tell you what happens there. So this is from this paper again. Uh, so this is a, a finite difference model that Tara Scary has put together, a code called I2VIS, where you do the balance of heat, mass, and momentum uh, in a finite difference uh, algorithm. You take two pieces of component 
and you push them together, or you, after some point you let them evolve on their own. And um, one of the nice things that uh, Taras does is he can put in so-called markers. So this would be individual rocks. These are these little squares here. You can track them and see what happens with them as the whole thing evolves. Okay. So in this particular model, we'll take a so it's very large scale, 4,000 to 700 kilometer box. Uh, you can use different values of heat generation for the sediments, and that's important, turned out to be critical for Sikkim, because the average continental heat production rate is this gray line here. So that's about uh, um, one point something uh, microwatt per cubic meter. Now, these are all analytical data from Sikkim going all the way from south to north. And what you see is that all of them have higher amounts of uranium, thorium, potassium. All of them had higher heat generation. They may have, in fact, lost some of that because you may have lost some uh, melt or fluid, which may have taken away some of the uranium, thorium, and potassium. So these are um, lower limits, and these are quite high than compared to average uh, crustal values. So we took those values for the models. And then for the lower crust, you can take various uh, rheological models. The one we took was plagioclase. If you take other models, the behavior changes. Now, so we ran all of those, but I'll just show you one movie with these features here. And we include heat from various sources. So that's a big difference from many of the older models where you had just conduction. This one uh, takes into account heat due to advection. Uh, um, which is a second big component. It also takes in um, the role of shear and radioactive heat generation, which is a very important uh, piece here. So now I want to do the movie and I have to change screens again. So this will be tricky. I'll try my best. So give me a minute. Um, This is tricky to try to get it to start in a way so that you can see it, but I will give it a go here. So let me just try something different here. Okay, so now it will work. And I don't know how we're doing on time, but I thought I'd run this. So we're coming to the end of it, but we run the movie uh, a couple of times so you can see what's going on. Mm -hmm. Now, do you see something? Can somebody tell me if you see something? We are seeing your home page. What are you seeing? So your home page. Your home page. That's not what I want to show you. So let me go back again. Um, stop sharing. Do you see it now? Yes, All right. So what you see here is um, uh, two pieces of crust that are colliding with each other. So the blue things, the large blue things, the areas of blue, are a mantle, a lithosphere and a stenosphere. Uh, the green things are a lower crust. 
Um, the gray parts are um, upper crustal sediments and things. And the white lines are what you want to track. Those are the isotherms. Okay, You want to see what they are doing. And um, as the model evolves, so on the top you have um, here, you have um, time that's running. So I'll run it twice to let you see that. So once you know what's going to happen the second time, you can watch for it. Um, and what you want to look for is uh, yellow areas appearing on the field. So yellow is when things begin to melt. And once it melts, see what the yellow things are doing. So, okay. so with that, I'll just let it run. So this is now converging. And you see that in this part here, the isotherms are moving uh, very um, dramatically. And so the idea of, you know, you go down in depth and have a steady geotherm is just very misplaced for a, for a, a dynamic metamorphic setting like that. Okay, so now you have this upper uh, crustal sediments getting buried in here, and that's when the heat starts to uh, collect and brings to melting, and it'll melt very soon now here, right around here. So, so there you have the isotherms building up, and then as the high heat generating sediments uh, get buried and stuck in this high temperature region, then at some point they produce melt. So you start the melt starts appearing here and see what happens to the melt immediately. It starts putting pushing the isotherms up and out towards the foreland. So this will be south towards India, if you think of this as Himalaya. Okay, so this is this melt and the isotherm is just moving up. So the rocks here are getting metamorphosed because of the isotherms actually moving in there. Okay, and this is now, this part here is kind of behaving like a channel. It's a hot, soft rock that's moving uh, more or less. Uh, on this scale, it looks more or less horizontal. But if you look at the markers in there, you will see they are going through significant decomposition. In fact, exactly like you can do it quantitatively, like the history that you're seeing in the rocks. Okay. So that here is what your channel would be like. And what ends up happening is, so once you've gone here, see what happens to the channel. Because once it it's cooling, you know, it moves out from the hot region here, it gets cooled, it go, goes below 500 degrees, then you have a migmatite, which is anything but hot and soft. You know, a migmatite is actually a very stiff, hard rock. So, um, so after it lands here, it's just stuck. I mean, it, this is this is a place where this channel is just uh, frozen. And then you have to do something to bring the rock up from that level up to the surface where you have it today. So um, maybe I'll just move forward. I can run the movie again afterwards if you want to see it as a, a question answer. So I'll just go back to the presentation to finish this up. Is it moving in time? Um, and okay, so now I have to So, um, try to share one more time. Stop sharing. Start. Now, do you see the presentation again? Yes, I'm sick. Okay. To try to go to full screen here. No, it's not showing the presentation mode. Uh, Back to uh, sorry about that. So it keeps showing my desktop again, right? 
Mm. So this is now, um, I'm sorry, I think I have to close the PowerPoint and restart it again because uh, it somehow doesn't work. PowerPoint didn't like the movie. Sorry about that. I should have done that movie at the very end of everything because movies are just I think the movie shows quite well how the whole thing happens dynamically but um, clearly it's not healthy for the PowerPoint. So So are you uh, having a problem with the PowerPoint? Sorry? Uh, uh, are you facing a problem with the PowerPoint? No, I'm sorry, are you seeing it? See it now? Okay, okay. Uh, yes, so we can see it. Okay. So um, this is just um, um, a few uh, calculated pressure temperature histories from that kind of model that you was showing. And, uh, you know, there are... Uh, the shape of this, I just want to show you, looks very similar to what you are seeing from the rocks. Okay, so getting it all together, so this is now a picture from that kind of a movie. So what you have is something like a channel, which then does happen, but then it comes and kind of freezes at the middle to lower crust. And then if you have to get the rock up from there in a brittle setting, you have such thrust fault kind of thing. So you have probably a high temperature part of the history, which is ductile, a large scale. And then you, um, from there, this point on, you have a low temperature part of the history, which is ductile brittle or eventually just brittle. And on a much smaller scale, on a localized uh, along individual fault planes. So um, putting that together, if you go back to our uh, depth temperature history here, so you have one part here, that would be the channel flow thing. And then you have a part here, which would be your um, transitional faulting thing. Now, if you get into that, there are different terms, uh, critical taper, wedge tectonics, and all of these mean very specific things to structural geologists. So we didn't want to get into that debate. We just wanted to say it's a localized fault bounded uh, tectonics. So we gave it a different name, it's localized fault bounded slice uh, tectonics uh, in whatever detail that happens. So the mid crust is basically a graveyard of channels. That's this thing here, you have multiple channels. They just go and pile up there. And after that, the fault bounded slices bring it all up. So that's the mechanism of um, exhumation that we're working out from looking at this pressure temperature history. So if you look at this such a pressure temperature history here, um, so you have after melting, this high temperature part is more channel flow, and then you have a transitional piece down here, maybe somewhere. And if you come down to the low temperature part, uh, lower pressure, lower temperature part, you have this uh, fault bounded slice tectonics. And what we have also put on there are different tools that we can use to study these rocks. And as you see again, uh, different tools give you information about different parts of the history of the rock. So the, uh, uranium lead zircon or the pressure temperature gives you this thing. So those tell you more about the channel flow part of the history. Whereas if you look at fission track or if you look at argon argon, you are probably down here. And those things will make you look like uh, you're looking at fault bounded slice tectonics. And that has been the essence of the debate. So if you look at all the arguments, pro and con, all the people who think that um, you don't have channel flow, you have uh, um, different variants of this uh, fault bounded slice tectonics are looking at features that freeze at relatively low temperatures and pressures down here. 
And all the people who are, or most of the people who are talking about, uh, or we see evidence of channel flow and so forth, are people who are looking at things out here. So our message is we probably have both. And then if that's true, then working in this region here, the transitional part where we have neither the strength of the classic metamorphic work nor the strength of uh, um, sedimentary tectonics structure work. And that's the region where a lot of work needs to be done. New tools need to be developed. That's something for all you students to work on if you get to that. So to end, I would just show this picture here and conclude with why I wanted to have that elephant picture on uh, the entrance of every geoscience department, because what we think is that we had both channel flow and fault bounded slice tectonics or you know, critical taper or wedge, whatever you call, want to call it. And it's just that, you know, some people were looking at the tusk, some people were looking at the tail, and they were arguing about what the elephant looks like. And what's very, very um, uh, enlightening and, and humiliating is that if you, in spite of all this debate, if you go back to the very earliest works on Sikkim, these are Mallet in 1875 and Auden in 1935, they pretty much had the history that we're telling now nailed. They said, so this was mostly about the lesser Himalaya, but where there's been a lot of argument, but they said normally there's neither fold nor thrust involved in the phenomenon. Uh, they are produced by injection and conate metamorphism of a granitic magma under stress, such as the magmatic zone of the higher Himalayas. That's pretty much describing the channel flow and uh, the movement of the isotherms and that causing the metamorphism. So I would like to leave you with that picture and uh, hope that whatever you do, whether you like this talk or not, believe this talk or not, you will go looking for the elephant and not the task of the leg not the year of the elephant. Thank you. I would like to thank Professor Chakravarti for this wonderful session. Thank you, sir, for such an enriching and interesting lecture. We are really enlightened with your knowledge and presence. Uh, sir, I have a request. Can you please email headphones instead of the external speakers because I think it is creating noise. Okay, I, can, I, I, I have a headphone but I don't have a speaker on my headphone. I can okay. try to closer to the... Um, so this is, this is uh, one of the problems of the corona uh, pandemic because once we started and everybody started doing this, I wanted to go buy one of those uh, microphones and they were all gone from the market. I have to try again. It was none okay, to be found. Uh, so, uh, okay, that's no problem. Thank you. Uh, we have received uh, several questions from our audience, which are in the process of being compiled. Once done, we will uh, surely like to address them to the speaker. We hope Professor Chakravarti will surely like to answer them. Uh, sir, you can now stop sharing the screen. Sir, you can now stop sharing this. Yeah, I did. Yes, yes sir. Well, uh, on a different note, I would like to remind everybody that tomorrow we shall be having uh, two lecture sessions in our Geochron Chapter 2, Day 2. We are going to have with us Professor Jan Fitzsimons, Head of School of Earth and Planetary Sciences, Perth, Australia, at 11 a.m. IST. And he will enlighten us on how does continental crust get really hot. And at 4.30 p.m. IST, we shall be having Dr. Pulok Shengupto of Geological Sciences, Jadupur University. And he will be delivering a lecture on the topic, Marvelous Marbles, a Sight to Insight. We are really very grateful to all our participants for such a wonderful response to the initiative. Uh, okay, mm. now that we have received the questions, we are going to start the question answer session. 
first i would like to say that going to the vast multitude of questions we have received we won't be able to accommodate all however we shall try to take as many possible to the speaker within the stipulated time so uh, for the first question we have urchishwan choudhury he is a bsc geology student from presidency university and he is asking that uh, if we are doing the dating using major minerals like garnet then why is it necessary to do further dating using accessory minerals like monazite and garnet as shown in the jigsaw puzzle um i lost you in between uh, can you do one thing maybe if you have it uh, posted in a something can you just send it to me quickly on an email because i just lost you in dating with garnet and what did you say after that so uh, shall i repeat one sir please please yes sir uh, his question is if we are doing the dating using major minerals like garnet then why is it necessary to do further dating using accessory minerals like monazite and garnet as shown in the jigsaw puzzle yeah oh, very good question because um, um the simple answer is because they don't form at the same time so um for example this becomes very critical uh, if you go to uh, a little bit lower grade rocks so um imagine you have a, a metapeolite which is getting metamorphosed and it starts uh, forming garnet when you reach the garnet zone so about 500 degrees or so uh, whatever pressure 5 kilobars let's say and um it turns out that if you date garnets uh, because uh, the element you use to date garnets is lutetium and hafnium that gets really sucked into the garnet at the beginning of its growth so you have more lutetium in the core than uh, on the outside so when you date the garnet using uh, lutetium you get the date of the initial growth of the garnet on the other hand the zircon for example um, may form at a much higher um, uh, temperature uh, at the peak of metamorphism where you have enough uh, fluid or maybe even a little bit of a melt to sort of dissolve and reprecipitate uh, zirconium which is a pretty uh, refractory mineral so the two dates could actually be different and give you information about one gives you information about the beginning of uh, crossing the garnet zone the other gives you information about the timing of peak temperature as an example so um in this case you know we had uh, different zones of zircons and monazites and using the trace elements we could relate each one of those to uh, different stages of the metamorphic history whereas the garnet date just gave you one number i mean it's just one point that happened to match with one of the zircon monazite dates but we had other dates from zircon and monazite that give you more information about more of the history uh, thank you sir thank you for the explanation for the next question we have deepjit pathuk he is a ms student from iit kharagpur and his question is can we use reaction diffusion modeling to model the subduction rates of plates and how they changed in course of time yes you can in principle uh, it's very tough um the main reason it is tough is because uh to set up the model is a little bit difficult but it's doable it's not a big problem uh the real problem is to model the reaction part of it because the kinetics of the reaction is is not um um very um well constrained well known or it depends on a lot of different factors uh, so that's been a um, big big problem i mean i have looked at it uh, um i um showed you um one of my ex students who was uh, priyadarshi he spent a lot of time looking at it and it's it's a tough problem it's something that we would like to do so yeah if you can manage to pull it off that would be great but uh, there are uh, issues related mainly to the fact that the reaction rates the number you have to put in in the reaction rate thing is not very well constrained uh, so he has one more question that uh, can periodicity of earthquakes or volcano eruptions be determined by diffusion chronometry 
Uh, volcanic eruptions, definitely. That's uh, a big field of uh, diffusion chronometry right now. In fact, um, I'm giving this talk here today, but I have pretty much uh, stopped working on uh, Sikkim right now, and most of my focus is on uh, volcanic rocks. Uh, earthquakes are trickier because, again, there you come back to the question we just looked at. It. Uh, earthquakes happen in the middle part of the crust, right? and largely. Uh, I'm not talking of you know very deep earthquakes and so forth. So um, by definition, you know it's a it's a brittle failure of uh, material, an earthquake, and that usually means it's low temperature. So you know you have low temperature and less time. So um, uh, for seismicity, diffusion chronometry is not that useful probably. Maybe for some uh, fast diffusing species in some um, post seismic creep and those kinds of uh, features. Uh, but for volcanology, absolutely, definitely. I and mean, that's the biggest field of application right now. Uh, thank you, sir. For the next question, we have Mr. Indrojit Saket, Department of Geology, Indira Gandhi National Tribal University, Amarkantak, Madhya Pradesh. And uh, he wants to for the explanation about zircon morphology and their geochronology study for the separation technique. So he wants to know how you separate zircon. Yes, sir. Okay, so that's uh, again it's very difficult to do on a medium like this because one would have to show you know equipment and things like that. But in a um, very broad nutshell. Um, what you do is you crush up the rock and then you do what is called heavy mineral separation. So zircon is heavier than uh, most of the normal silicates. So you run it through a, a table with, with um, uh, you know, um, some fluid, uh, water uh, and wash it. And you basically try to wash away all the other stuff and concentrate the zircon. And after that, it's a very painstaking very time consuming uh, work with a microscope. You sit on a binocular microscope, not your polarization microscope, and look at these grains and you pick them out. And then that's about where my expertise ends. That's why you need different people in these kinds of things. But uh, I mean, I actually have a student now um, from India, Shampriti. Uh, she did a lot of uh, the zircon work. And it turns out, you know, when you look at the morphology, you have to pick different kinds and different um, uh, sorts of zircons and so forth. Thank you, sir. For the next question, uh, we have Vipin Dube, NGRI Hyderabad. He is asking, what can you say about the dehydration processes with respect to steep exhumation process? Also, does steep exhumation processes offer in paired metamorphic types? Um, uh, the first one I'll take first. So, uh, dehydration process on um, steep exhumation um, it depends. So, basically, um, decompression can promote uh, degassing. Uh, but it depends very much on the reaction you're looking at and the slope of that reaction. So um, there are, um, um, that's where, you know, the clausius clapeyron slope of a reaction, whether it's positive or negative, becomes very, very critical. Um, so if you happen to cross a, a, a dehydration boundary during your decompression, it will uh, decompress. And that actually has an internal feedback in it as well become again in interesting in igneous systems in granites and so forth because if you uh, dehydrate then you have a free volatile phase so that's the, usually accompanied by a large uh, volume change and that tends to um, arrest the process sometimes so it can become a internal control um, of its own um, but um, yeah so it depends really on the specific reaction that you're looking at um, and the second part of the question was what So the second part of the question is, does steep exhumation processes occur in paired metamorphic belts? Paired metamorphic belts. Um, 
I don't have a direct answer. I think it um, can be possible. Uh, one of the things is in, in doing all these uh, geodynamic models is that uh, uh, it's really like a toy and you can play with different parameters. And it's just amazing the and different range of behavior that you can see by varying different kinds of parameters. So um, yes, in some cases you see um, decompression paths, whether they actually happen in nature, um, I don't know. I mean, uh, so that one I'd have to say, I'm not sure about. Thank you, sir. For the next question, we have Mr. Shukalpu Chatterjee. He is a research scholar in the University of Bern, Switzerland, and he has sent you greetings from there. So his questions is regarding the elemental map of the garnets. Have you also done pictorial elemental map on the garnet? If yes, do you find any trace of remelting events within the garnets from the wired data? Uh, any trace of what? So any trace of remelting events within the garnets? Remelting event within the garnet. So on these garnets, we actually um, uh, didn't do too much of uh, yttrium work. We did some. Um, now, I'm not sure we see remelting, but uh, with the yttrium uh, data, you actually see even more history in the thing. The, uh, piece of history that you see is uh, consistent with the overall picture that I was showing you, but what you start to see is more pulses of events, and we haven't studied that. Like I said, I've kind of stopped working on Sikkim, and I have not gone back to do that now. One can do a lot better uh, trace element mapping now, and uh, that would be something to do. So that's something that's been done on the lower grade rocks in, in great detail by Freya George. Freya George was a student with Fred Guidis, who worked with me earlier. And Freya George was a PhD student of Fred Guidis. So she did a lot of very detailed uh, trace element mapping work, but uh, on the lower grade rocks, on the garnet zone rocks. Uh, I don't think she has looked at uh, high temperature rocks, high pressure rocks. So that would be, um, yeah, I mean, again, another problem that's waiting to be looked at and done. Mm -hmm. But you do see more events when you look at um, yttrium. Thank you, sir. We have uh, two to three more questions. So the next question is from Ankun Bhattacharya. He is a UG3 student of Presidents University. His question is, can channel flow theory tell us about the PT evolutionary path of the metamorphism? Or we have to study the critical taper for studying the evolutionary paths properly. Um, well, what I was trying to show you is that you have to do both. Um, you cannot just uh, do one, but uh, if you have to pick one, and if you're going to focus on high-grade metamorphism, uh, I would say channel flow is the one that will tell you more about it than um, the critical taper or uh, whatever the other mode is, simply because of the fact that when you, the rocks are hot, they are soft and they will flow and uh, they will not um, be um, form uh, brittle uh, fault blocks. So, um, but to get an overall sense of it, you need to do both. I mean, you cannot just do one and, and, uh, and particularly the part where you have the transitional zone, where the uh, channel flow is uh, freezing, you know, it um, can start freezing even as high as 600 degrees. And so from below there, what goes on for that part, you do need the critical taper or whatever block tectonics kind of uh, modes that you need. So, yeah, you need to do both. Uh, thank you so much, sir. For the next question, we have Shoham Banerjee. He's a pass out from Presidential University. And he is asking, how were the channel flow and fault bounded tectonic models controlled or affected by the variations in isotherm patterns? Um, very strongly. <laughs> so that is the whole whole um, um, key fun and, and complexity of the whole thing. Because I'm, I'm, I was just talking about the fact that when it's hot and uh, 
um, soft, things will tend to flow. So that's more like channel flow. And when it's cold and brittle, it'll tend to form blocks and form more like uh, uh, you know, critical taper or some form of wedges or blocks. But what you also saw in the movie, and that's why I think the movie is important, uh, that the isotherms are not fixed. They are moving, and they're moving very um, uh, dynamically. Yeah? I mean, it's not just you can just say, uh, it cannot even, they're folded, so you cannot even say um, shallower depths, lower temperatures. Okay, so at um, certain places you have uh, higher temperature at shallower depths and, uh, and so on. So, um, so that gives the next level of twist to the whole thing. So something, you know, imagine you have a channel that has frozen and has become a block. But then, you know, if an isotherm sweeps in and makes it uh, hot again, it can begin to flow again. So you can have full pulsed channel flow and pulsed block tectonics and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, that's just a next level of dynamics that we are not even beginning to get at, but it's almost certainly there because these isotherm fields, like I said at the beginning of the uh, field uh, diagram, are not fixed geotherms. They are not fixed. The temperature at any given point is not uh, a steady state. Yeah. Thank you, sir. The next question, we have Dr. Arindam Bhattacharya. He is the faculty of University of Sezet, Hungary. And he is asking, how are the adiabatic PT conditions and processes involved in the steep exhumation and channel flow hypothesis in the convergent zone settings? Um, one of the things, it's the steep exhumation is something that you can read from the metamorphic record. So whether it's channel flow or not, so we need to separate the two out, I think, first. So the uh, steep exhumation is something that's there in the rock. That happened. And whether it was channel flow or something else, that is up to us to decide and determine. Now, what we are saying is that uh, channel flow or the kind of channel flow I was showing, which is not the channel with a funnel, uh, it's very important to make that distinction. Um, so the channel flow um, gives a way to do that that is plausible and seems to match certain quantitative aspects of the um, uh, rocks. But there are also a list of things that they do not match. So this is by no means the end of the story. So there are problems with the date. There are problems with these multiple channels. Uh, there are uh, issues with uh, uh, different pulses of melting. So there's a lot more detail that we just haven't looked at it, haven't done yet, uh, although it's doable. The tools are there to start looking at those. So one so for the students here, that's, those are things that they could do uh, for their work. Now, whether that exhumation in the channel flow model, so that's something that's coming from the model now, uh, whether that's adiabatic, uh, that again depends on the model parameters because you can, um, depends on how, um, depends really on how you run the model, but um, uh, this doesn't have to be adiabatic. So that's different from uh, adiabatic decompression melting that we think of, for example, in the mantle. So this is a different sort of behavior. Thank you, sir. For the next question, and it is the second last question, uh, we have Mr. Shibnarayan Dash, research scholar of Delhi University, India. And he's asking that what are the effects on bulk composition of the rocks when they go through the steep exhumation? Yeah, <laughs> very good question. So the critical issue that comes up is you're taking a rock and you are you are uh, uh, taking a partially molten rock and you're exhuming it. Uh, so the, wouldn't the melt segregate? Wouldn't the melt just leave? And um, yes, it can. And it almost certainly does to a point. Um, but um, what we also know is that when we look at the rock at the outcrop today, uh, there are um, trapped melt in there. So yes, we may have some lost some melt, but um, we certainly do have molten rocks, uh, rocks with melt that went through that um, history of uh, 
uh, steep decompression and then cooling. So, um, so the males may have been lost, volatiles almost certainly uh, could have been lost. So yes, there could have been um, changes in bulk compositions, at least due to those two features. But um, it is by no means uh, so that uh, once you are trying to decompress the thing, you lose all the melt, and therefore you lose the density and viscosity advantage that you have to cause the exhumation and the melting. So there's some metal that's there, and as long as there's some uh, there, that rock will have a lower density and lower viscosity than a rock with uh, no melt and uh, no, uh, yeah, no melt and no fluids. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. Uh, due to time constraint, we have to wrap up the session now. So one final question, and this is from Devarun Mukherjee. UG3 student of Presidency University and he is asking how does geodynamic modeling and study of isotopes in the strong metasomatism indicators help us to determine metasomatic history extent in the collision setting? Um, so geodynamic modeling is modeling that just tells you what the possibilities are. So modeling never tells you what happened. So that's what I tell people. So modeling tells you what is possible. And then you have to go and look at the rocks to see what happened. Um, so you can do the models to set, find out possibilities that could happen. And then you go and look at the rocks. So for example, um, people look at things like boron isotopes to look at uh, um, uh, the effect of fluid loss, volatile loss, and uh, or volatile incorporation from um, something getting uh, dehydrated deeper down, uh, or you know deeper down or at hotter region in the same depth, uh, and you can use that to. Um, you have to couple that. So you have to not just geodynamic modeling. So that's a three-point model uh, coupling. So you have to couple geodynamic modeling with fluid flow modeling and isotopes, and that would be a very, very powerful tool and hasn't been done enough uh, by any means. Fluid flow coupled with geodynamic modeling is something that uh, is very promising and possible to do and one could do a lot with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for all these explanations. We have uh, almost come to the end of today's session of Geochron 2020. So I would now like to thank Bhattacharya, Secretary of Geological Institute, for the vote of thanks. So over to you, Amrita. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ritanu. So we express our gratitude to Professor Shumit Chakraborty for taking out the time from his busy schedule to be with us today. Thank you so much, sir, again. We are very much eager to maintain this relationship of love among us. And we hope to have you with us in the future for any such lecture or workshop. Please visit us, the Department of Geology President University, whenever you find yourself in Kolkata. Last but not the least, I also extend my thanks to all the participants for the enormous cooperation. Uh, we will just take a screenshot to preserve the memory of the session. Okay. So I just wanted to say a quickly thank to all of you for uh, coming in here on a Saturday afternoon. I assume people have better things to do on a Saturday afternoon than talking to geology talks. We cannot hear you. <laughs> Again, it's something that's really up in the air. So we will all see when it's possible to travel and be back there again. So we all look forward to that. Thank you again for setting this up and doing all of this. Thank you so much, sir. So uh, that has been taken and hope to see you all again as we reconvene tomorrow at 11 a.m. Uh, till then, adieu and uh, have a nice day to everyone.
Thank you, Shomitra. So,